morning. Uh, as Chris said, uh, my name is Rick, and I preach here. If this is your first time here, I'd like to extend a personal welcome to you. And as he also said correctly, we are in our second week of our Jesus Is series. So we're talking a little bit more about who Jesus is. A few weeks ago was Easter, uh, and Easter really dealt with how Jesus resurrected from the dead. And if the resurrection is true, then what the Bible says about Jesus is true. And the resurrection is true. It it did happen. There are really good historical arguments for why Christianity is true. And last week we talked about how Jesus is accessible, how he wants to be available to minister to people and to love people. And if Jesus was accessible to the people around him and in his community, we should be accessible to the people around us and in our community. Today we're going to be talking about how Jesus is merciful. And mercy is one of those things that a lot of us probably really do struggle with because a lot of us in this room and our culture loves to see people get what they deserve, don't we? I was raised in a family, like my family was ruthless, man. You would get hurt, you would injure yourself, you would make a mistake. My family would not only laugh at you, I'm like having a cut down my leg, bleeding, like going to go into cardiac arrest. My grandpa would be like, ha, get what you deserve, buddy. <laughs> I'm like, grandpa, I'm going to die. And he's like, suit yourself. <laughs> it was really brutal. Not really. Like, that never really happened. That's just an example. Like, just tried to make it seem worse than probably what it was. You ever do that? Anyways, so we all want mercy. If you get pulled over by a police officer, there is no doubt in your mind you're trying to come up with whatever possible excuse you can to get out of that ticket, right? Anything you can say, anything that you can do, try to make yourself look distressed. I saw this really cool posting online. They said, always carry a box of office supplies in your next door, uh, in, the, in the seat next to you, so it looks like you just got fired from your job, you know? So that way you don't, like, technically lie, but it kind of looks that way. That's not Christian. We should never do that. That would be really bad. But, you know, like, I used to love Rocky. Rocky is one of my favorite things, you know what I mean? And when Apollo Creed was talking smash to Rocky, I'm like, man, this guy's going to get what he deserves. And he did, didn't he? And then when Apollo Creed dies because the Russian killed him, I wanted nothing more than to see Rocky just utterly destroy this guy. I mean, he's going to get what he deserves. He killed one of my best friends who wasn't my best friend before in season one, you know what I mean? We think that way. But mercy is one of those things that the Bible has a lot to say about. God, without a shadow of a doubt, the Bible says over and over again how God is merciful. I'd like to share a story with you in Mark chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be dealing with a woman uh, who suffers a lot of physical, uh, social, religious, you would say, persecution. She is isolated from her community. Uh, But let me give you a little bit of background story about the message of this woman. Jesus had recently healed two demon-possessed people, and he was beginning his ministry. And he told these men who were healed, don't go and tell anybody yet. But eventually, word does kind of get around. And so Jesus is becoming a really popular guy. He is a prolific teacher. He's been baptized by John. The guy is an incredible minister of the word. He has stood up to the hypocritical, pharisaical, religious elites. And he's really, he's really the most compassionate, but the most righteous person that these people have ever met. And so he comes back from this journey. And on his way back, uh, he's on a boat and the crowds began to surround him again. And he begins to teach them. Well, not even a few lessons in to this sermon, he is approached by a man whose daughter is dying. Now, I have a daughter, she is two years old, and I can only imagine the amount of anxiety and hurt and fear that would come along with somebody that you love so much, that is so young, that deserves to live a long, happy life, is dying. And so he comes to Jesus, and he, and he asks for Jesus to come and heal his daughter. And because Jesus is accessible, he leaves immediately. Well, like I said, Jesus is a really popular guy. And so he's walking through town, and the streets back in the biblical times, they weren't very wide. They were probably somewhat as narrow as this column down the room. And the people began to pour out. The crowds began to come and begin to press in on him. I mean, it would be like if everybody in this room all of a sudden got up and wanted to come close to me, right? Does anybody struggle from, like, being claustrophobic in here? I do. I do not like the idea of people being, like, really, really close to me, and I just start randomly punching and stuff like that, you know? It's weird. It's almost like, I'm just kidding, I don't do that. But anyway, so here's Jesus. I'm sorry if this is your first time here. I don't normally do this. Okay. But but Jesus, Jesus is getting pressed in by people, and there are crowds that are around him, and he is on a mission, but it's being impeded by this, this crowd. And in the midst of this crowd is a woman who is desperate. 
and she is struggling. And if you were a religious leader of that day, you would probably, you would definitely look at this woman as somebody undeserving of the grace of God, unclean, must have committed some type of sin to deserve this horrible physical condition. And so she would have been an outcast of society. Yet through the passion story, through what we call the Bible or the Gospels, we see one of the most incredible women ever to have known to have come close and interact with Jesus. Both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us a record about who this woman was, and we really don't know her name. But here's what we find about this woman, picking up in verse 25 of Mark chapter 5. It says this, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years years. She had some type of internal hemorrhage that caused her to bleed. She didn't have a normal cycle, in other words. And ladies, can you, can you even imagine in our time, in our day, where this isn't something that is socially or religiously taboo. This is something that our wives, our parents, our daughters all deal with, but it never ending. And so women, I, I can imagine if you would place yourself in this position just to even know what it would be like to go through something like this physically. Maybe some of you have struggled with a disease. Maybe you've been isolated and ostracized from your uh, family. Maybe you've been divorced for a certain amount of years. I don't know what your problem is, but this woman had a problem. It was a physical problem, and she bled for 12 years. Verse 26 says, She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. And look at this. She had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. She is frankly, she is a mess. Not only does she have this female problem, but if you know anything about old law, you, were, you would know that to have this type of bleeding would declare you ceremonially unclean. In other words, you wouldn't be allowed to go into the temple and worship God with your family and your friends and your brothers and sisters because you are unclean. What would happen under the Old Testament is when women would go through their monthly cycle, they would actually get a week of vacation away from the community, away from their kids, away from their jobs and their husbands, and they would have a week-long powwow, right, with their, I know, it's kind of cool when you think about it like this. Ladies, you'd be like, man, we need to bring that one back, you know what I mean? (laughs) But they would get to go for a week and not have to do anything, and the husbands would cook and clean and work and take care of the house. I mean, it was kind of a cool deal, but, you know, there's give and take and everything. So anyways... So she wouldn't have been allowed to go into the temple, cut off from the religious leaders, cut off from worshiping God. Not only that, but anybody that she touched would be declared unclean. And they would have to separate themselves from the community. And so you can imagine what this lady had gone through. Not only is she cut off because the the Levitical law says that she's unclean, she's cut off from worshiping God, but she's also cut off from her community. Nobody wants to be around this woman because nobody wants to be declared unclean. Nobody wants to be separated and have to go through the various rituals. So if she touched anybody, they would be unclean. Or if anybody accidentally touched her, they would be declared unclean. It's a really tragic situation. Not only is she outcast in religious excommunication, not only is she socially rejected, she can't even get married. Think about that. All of a sudden, she's got the world at her fingertips. She develops this physical problem, and she can't even have a relationship and get married and fulfill what she believes to be is God's purpose for her life, to get married and have kids and be a Proverbs 31 woman. But it gets even worse, as we found in this text. She is broke. She's got nothing no money. And I can imagine this woman sitting in her isolated spot and her isolated home away from everyone and everything. She had spent every dime she had ever had, but she hears about this guy named Jesus. Not only does he heal people, but he seems to be incredibly graceful, while at the same time being a man that upholds the law, somebody who is righteous, somebody who always does the right thing and never sins against God. And I could just imagine her sitting in her home, and she's hurt, she's broken, she's desperate, and she's thinking, if only I could get around this guy named Jesus, I may, I may be healed. Only if I could get close to Jesus, I may be healed. But to touch him would make him unclean. It could ruin his ministry. It could destroy everything that this guy is trying to work for. And so you can imagine this tension, desperate, Hopeful, 
but yet she doesn't want to ruin other people's lives. She doesn't want to break the law. What kind of decision is she going to make? Well, 12 years she had lived without her strength, without her social intercourse, without worship, and now without her money, and she is desperate for a miracle. And so we go on in our passage of Scripture here, picking up in verse 27. It says, When she heard about Jesus... She came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak. And because she thought, if I just even touch his clothes, I will be healed. And so let's look at her mindset. Remember, touching Jesus would have made him unclean. It would have rendered his ministry uh, momentarily ineffective until he went through the various rituals. And she would have sealed the fate of this man's daughter. I mean, think about that. He's not going to be able to travel to heal her. And if I touch him and he's declared unclean, This girl is going to die. I mean, can you imagine being that desperate? These are the types of things that the people in the Bible were going through, much like many of us go through today. And so she couldn't approach Jesus in the synagogue. Why? She's cut off from the community. She couldn't approach Jesus privately, right? Maybe just a little private healing. Why? He was always around people, healing and preaching and teaching. And even during his alone time, he would always have two or three disciples around him. And so in the midst of this crowd, she decides that she's going to reach out and touch his clothes. But remember, people were pressing in on Jesus. So to get to Jesus, she's got to get through other people. She's got to overcome. We talked about this last week. She's got to overcome certain barriers that are preventing people from having access to Jesus. But in her desperation, she decides, I don't care if I break the law or not. I know that this little girl may be sick, but I've been sick for 12 years. And in a moment of desperation, but absolute faith, she reaches out and she touches the clothes of Jesus. Let's look at what happens here. She says in verse 29, immediately, when she touched his clothes, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And at once, Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd. Very, very powerful, right? Jesus turns around in the crowd and he asks, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, who touched me? He's like, dude, get it together. Everybody's touching you, right? Claustrophobia 101. I mean, people were pressing on on this guy. But Jesus felt the power leave from his clothes. Look what, it said. Look what he goes on to say here. Verse 32, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. It was in this moment that she experienced the glory of God through the mode of divine healing. And Jesus wants to find this woman, right? He wasn't just saying, oh, well, praise the Lord. Somebody got healed. I hope you go around your day and, uh, you know, things are going to go well for you and I'm just going to go on my mission. No, Jesus stops in the midst of this crowd. He recognizes that his power had gone out from him. And he says, not only who touched me, but he was on a mission to find out who was the person who acted out in such incredible faith that felt his kind of healing. You see, the truth is that he wants to be accessible to the messy in order to reveal his divine mercy. Jesus wants to be accessible to the messy in order to reveal his divine mercy. This lady wasn't just somebody who should go around about her day and feel healed. No, Jesus wants to turn around and he wants to find the messy woman. And the question is why? Because Jesus isn't interested in an impersonal response to our desperation of his divine glory. He is not interested in you being a closet Christian. He is not interested in you just getting through it by yourself. Jesus wants a relationship with the people that he loves and that he heals. And so he's going to find this woman. The Bible says in the Old Testament that there was going to come a day when God would seek out the broken. I love these passages of scripture. Ezekiel 34, 11, God himself says, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. And again, 34, 16, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the scattered. I will bind the broken and I will strengthen the sick. You see, not only has this woman here uh, heard about Jesus's grace and his healing power, But she's also heard about Jesus' law and his justice and how he always does things that are right. And as we talked about leading up to this point, she has this tension. Should she break the law at the possibility of divine healing? Should she take a chance on Jesus' mercy even though she would be a lawbreaker? And you know, the text says that she doesn't immediately reveal herself. Why don't you think she did that? 
she thinks Jesus is going to take me according to the law. I mean, I know this guy heals people. I know he gives grace to people, but Jesus is going to take me according to the law and he's going to give me what I deserve, a lawbreaker. And yes, I've been healed, but at the same time, I am in violation of the law. I'm humiliated. I am embarrassed. What worse could happen? That's exactly what's going through her mind. And I think about this. How many Christians today are unwilling to return to church or to God's presence because they feel there's going to be judgment and ostracism and condemnation. And they think if I come back to be healed, I'm going to be taken according to the law and people are going to judge me and push me out and say, where have you been all this time? Haven't seen you in a while. You know, the, the soft and subtle way that Christians show their judgment to other people, right? I mean, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the reason why we hide our sins from people and we don't share our weaknesses? It's because we are so desperately afraid that if we reveal our brokenness, we're going to be judged and condemned and taken according to the law. After all, we are a society who really loves to see people get what they deserve. But the truth of the matter is, is everybody, every single person in this room has experienced mercy in some way, shape, or form, especially from God. And if God gave us all what we deserved, we would not be here. Not any one of us. And so here's this woman, absolutely desperate. But yet we find over and over again this description about who God is and who Jesus was, the embodiment of God. Look at these scriptures I have for you up on the screen. John 3, 17, after our famous John 3, 16 verse. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him him. You see, judgment is coming, but grace, grace is offered now. God will judge us, but grace is offered now. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus has come to save us, not condemn us. 1 Timothy 1.15, we got the Apostle Paul, who's probably been one of the most terrible sinners ever read about in Scripture. Murdered people, did terrible things to the church, and yet here is Paul saying, it is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, amongst whom I am the foremost of all. You want to hear something that's true? I am a sinner in need of God's grace, but yet God has chosen to save me. That is something that is true. And so we can't get away, even though we talk about the righteousness of God and the justice of God, and God is holy, and he must punish sin. It was Jesus' ministry, and it was his method to save sinners, to save them, not only from their sin, but from what their sin was going to bring about. And so after Jesus' relentless pursuit of the person that touched him, look what we find in verse 33. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came And fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the truth, the whole truth. Remember, she broke the law. And here she is, in a moment of desperation, throwing herself down at the feet of Jesus. And she just says, I just need to tell you the truth about what happened. And so the truth is that Jesus' response to our mess is mercy. We are messy. We make mistakes. The Bible pictures sin as this filthy, dirty person. In fact, it even uses this imagery of this woman, right? They had menstrual cycles. They didn't have the technology that we have today, and so they had to take an old rag, and that's the only thing that they were able to use. And the Bible says our sins are like filthy rags. That's us. And so if you can picture this woman cut off from God, cut off from the people that love her the most and that she wants to be around, unable to marry, now completely broke, in total desperation. And this is a picture and an image of who we are before our salvation in Jesus Christ. We are cut off from God. We are desperate. We are broken. There is no amount of money that we could pay, no amount of good works that we could do that could ever possibly get us right with God. The only thing that we can rely on is God's mercy. The only thing that we can do is throw ourselves at the feet of the cross and ask God, will you save me a sinner? Somebody who tells the truth but relies on God's mercy. And look at what Jesus says to her in verse 34. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. 
What an incredible response about Jesus. He didn't take her according to the law. He didn't say, let me turn to all these Old Testament commands and show you what you've done. No, Jesus, first of all, calls her daughter. To call somebody a daughter in this, in this phrase would mean to restore her back to her position and her relationship with God. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He says, daughter, go in peace. Be healed from your suffering. There was another time when Jesus was teaching his disciples and his mother and his siblings were outside and somebody came to Jesus and they said, hey, Jesus, your family's outside wanting to come see you. And you know what Jesus does? He turns to those beside him and he touches them on their shoulders. And it says in Matthew 12, 50, he says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. This is who my family is. And he looks at this broken woman on her knees in total desperation. And he says, you are a part of my family. He restores her, ostracized from her community and probably even from her own family. And yet Jesus says, you're a part of my family now. He tells her that it was her faith that healed her. Why? Because he wants to dispel all confusion. This wasn't by magic. This wasn't by chance. But it was by her belief in the unseen because of what she had previously experienced. She heard about this guy named Jesus. And you know, a lot of people, they misunderstand what it means to have faith, that it's a blind leap in the darkness, or it's believing in spite of evidence. That is not what faith means. That's an arbitrary, poor definition of faith. Faith means to be convinced of what you don't see because of what you do see. It means to be convinced that Jesus is who he says he is because of the evidence that I have, that I experience, and that I know. And you got this woman who's heard about Jesus, who understands that this could be the Messiah. And she places her hope, her trust, her unswervingly confidence in Jesus the Christ. And that is the reason why she is healed. Jesus believes that she can be restored. She believes that she can be restored. And Jesus is the one who can do that, and it happens. And then he tells her to go in peace and live free. And this was to assure her that she's been forgiven, that she has God's grace, that she's not just been healed, but now she is in right standing with God. I mean, think about the powerful testimony here. How many of us have been in the exact same situation as this woman? And the only reason why we don't come back to God is because we think we're going to be judged and condemned when the opposite is true. It's the exact opposite. God wants a relationship with us. He wants to give us his grace and his mercy. He wants to overcome our mess if we're willing to meet him at the cross. He says, go in peace. Be healed. Have a right standing with God. You see, it was in this moment that she told him the whole truth. That, yeah, she had this physical condition that wasn't really her fault. But at the same time, there's a much bigger picture here. That she is a lawbreaker. She is somebody that is at odds with God. And she took a very big risk by putting herself on the line. And yet God gives her his mercy in Jesus of of, of Nazareth. And so a simple definition of mercy, if you could remember this, is simply this. Mercy is not getting what you rightfully deserve. It's getting pulled over by the police officer and asking the officer to let you go. And even though you have broken the law and you can come up with a thousand excuses why, at the end of the day, what are you? You're a lawbreaker, right? And even though we may think we're a good person, maybe you've never broken man-made laws, but at the end of the day, you and I are in the same category. We stand before a holy, just God as a lawbreaker. We are sinners. In fact, this woman doesn't even begin, excuse me, to display the tragedy of our situation. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Paul writes to the church. He says, God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ, for it is by grace you have been saved. You were dead. You weren't just some lady with a physical issue. You were someone who was incapable of ever making things right with God again, totally cut off, totally separated, utterly removed, regardless of how much money you have, how many good things you have, how long you've been in church, whether or not your parents are Christians, the color of your skin, it doesn't matter. You were cut off, but God being rich in mercy, 
God doesn't just sit up in heaven thinking, who can I punish today? Who am I going to zap with this problem and give that problem? Let me think about this. How many people can I send to hell by creating a world where the least amount of people can be saved? That is not who God is. God wants a relationship with you. He is rich in mercy. And you know, I was thinking about, man, how could I really give a relationship to somebody in this church in the sense of how can I relate a story, right? How could I give you something that you can connect with and say, oh, I can remember that now because, uh, because Rick got mercy in this situation. And you know what the truth is? I really couldn't think of one good example about my life in which I have received mercy. And you know why? Because it's like a daily thing. I'm serious. It is like a daily thing where God gives me his mercy every single day. I mean, the simple matter is, is that I could be just removed from life, punished, my thoughts, my actions, my attitude. I mean, I am a sinner and I get God's mercy every single day. And so do you. God is rich in mercy. And so if God has given us mercy, the question is, is what is our response What is our response to the messiness of others? And I can just imagine, look, the disciples kind of developed this reputation for making Jesus some isolated figure that only certain people could come to him. Children would try to come to him and they would try to push him away. And you know what Jesus said? Forbid not these little ones to come unto me. Lepers would come to Jesus and they'd be like, Jesus, you can't make yourself unclean. You can't associate yourselves with those people. And Jesus would relentlessly go to them. And so here's the question for us this morning. How would we react to the woman who was healed by Jesus. What is our response? If I can convince you of this single truth today, it will be a victory, and it's simply this. If God has extended his mercy to you, which he has, you should extend your mercy to the people around you. If God has given you the mercy of eternal salvation and has removed your guilt and removed your sin and removed your punishment, if God's given you that kind of mercy, is there anybody in your life that you shouldn't be willing to extend mercy to you or to them? Parents with children. Man, this is a, this is a big one, isn't it? Your kids disobey. You do have to discipline them. But man, there are times where you need to extend mercy and not ride their backs every chance you can get. Kids, your parents are imperfect. And there are times where they're not going to be the greatest human being on the face of this earth. They're going to make mistakes. Don't take them according to the law and throw up all their failures in their face. Husbands and wives, give each other mercy. Don't always take each other according to the law. And you might hear an amen from my wife, right? Because, man, there are times when I can just be relentless. Over small things. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely true. We've got to give mercy to people. If we have God's mercy, then we should be merciful to others. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If you want to receive mercy from God, you should probably think about giving mercy to other people. Blessed are those who give mercy, for you shall receive mercy. And again, Luke 6, 36, be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. You know, the early church started to develop this reputation where they started to split themselves into different classes, right? Richer, poorer. In fact, what they used to do, and man, this would be cool, what they used to do is they would come together and they would eat uh, what we call a love feast. It would be a meal, And then they would take the Lord's Supper and they would have preaching, but it was probably a whole lot more community than what our 21st century church has to offer us today. Things change, I get it, it happens. But anyway, so they would come together and they would eat together and they would share the word together and praise the Lord and they would take the Lord's Supper. Well, what happened was, is if you were a slave or if you were somebody who was poor, you would have to work during Sunday. And so you would work all day, and at the end of that day, you would come together to worship the Lord. Well, the people who were rich would eat before the people who were poor got there. And so some were hungry, right, the poor people, and others were full. And they began to separate themselves. They'd say, hey, poor guy, you can sit down there in the corner. The rich people are going to sit up here because we're more important. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 had to lay down the law. He says, look, while this is a good thing and you can do this, unfortunately, you've made church more about food and social status than about Jesus and communion. And so eat at home. Don't even bring your food, right? You guys eat your food at home. Come together to worship me. That's basically what happened. 
And so, as you can imagine, right, poor people would start to get the short end of the stick. They'd come to the church. They wouldn't have clothing. They wouldn't have food. And these Christians would say, well, we love you, but I hope it all works out, right? We love you, but I hope, I hope life is you. And James really nails it home in James chapter 2. He says, how can you claim to be a Christian and follow God and have faith but no good works? How can you claim to follow Jesus and somebody comes to you in need and you say, well, because you're poor, you must be getting what you deserve. We love you, but we're not going to intervene and help. My mother herself has shared this story with me many times. And my mom won't claim to be the most perfect person on this earth. But when she was a single mom of two, working a couple jobs, she was hurting. She was, she was broke. She needed food. She went to a local church in town. It was her former church. Now she went to another one. And she said, look, I just got to get some food, put some food on the table for my kids. And they said this, well, we'll give you a call back. They called her back and they say, well, if your parents aren't helping you, there must be a good reason why. And they didn't even give her any food. And she says, that's the message that the church shared with me. Yeah, I've made mistakes. Who, so care, who cares if, I, if I'm living in sin right now? I don't even have food. And that's what was happening in James chapter 2. He says, you guys claim to be Jesus followers, but yet when people really come to you in need, you turn them away. And he says this, you are taking people according to judgment rather than mercy. And he shares one of the most powerful passages of scripture in James chapter 2 verse 13. He says, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. You stand before God living your life, never sharing mercy with anyone. And when judgment day comes, you best believe God will judge you with the measure that you've measured with other people. And then he says this, but mercy triumphs over judgment. I like that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word triumph here is another word for boast or exalt. Nine times out of ten in Scripture, it's used in the negative sense. But here it's used in this positive sense. That it's like this. Every time you come to God with your weaknesses and your failures, mercy screams much louder. Every time Satan accuses you before God because of your sins, mercy screams much louder. Every time you come to God with a guilty conscience, saying how much you failed and let God down, God's mercy screams much louder. It boasts and it speaks and it shouts down your sins. That's how powerful mercy is. And so I want you to picture yourself this morning, standing before God, and you go off to tell him your sins, and with the loudest voice that sounds like thunder, it is mercy, not your sins. You see, when you are forgiven... God's mercy will shout so much louder than your mess. And that's the simple point that I want to leave you with this morning. Is that when mercy meets messy, mercy always wins with God. Much like the woman, mercy always wins. And so if you are in Christ this morning, I want to encourage you that, yeah, I'm sure you've made your fair share of mistakes And yeah, maybe you've been off track these last few months, these last few years, but God is willing to extend his grace and mercy to you this morning. But maybe you're not in Christ. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you've never followed the plan of salvation where you place your trust, your faith in Jesus, and you tell the truth, just like the woman at the feet of Jesus. I am a sinner, a lawbreaker, and I am come to you in desperate need of healing. Maybe you're like the woman And the truth is, is that you can receive God's mercy today. The Bible says if you're willing to place your trust, your faith in Jesus, and turn away from your sin and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, you can receive God's mercy. And it is a promise. And it is a conditional promise. You have to be willing to be like the woman and come to the feet of the cross and tell the truth and accept God's grace. And you know what would be crazy? If we looked at the woman in a desperate need of God's grace and mercy, and we say, man, she must have earned her salvation because she met Jesus in the street and she reached out to him and she touched his clothes and God healed her. We would be crazy to say that that woman earned or deserved God's grace. And you know what faith is? Faith is an open hand reaching out to God and receiving his mercy. And that takes place at the time that you are baptized. And you can get God's mercy forever. 
That's the promise that he extends to you. And so I'm going to ask that you stand, and we're going to sing the song of invitation. And if you want to accept God's mercy today, I want to invite you to do that.